Hello, my name is James Trost and this is A2 Insight. Today's guests are Susan Weinberg and Patrick McCauley. Our two authors have written this book, Historic Ann Arbor, an architectural guide. So our hope is that we're going to be going through and learning a lot about the different kinds of styles and histories behind all the interesting architecture here in Ann Arbor. Patrick and Susan, welcome to A2 Insight. Thank, Thank you for you. having us. Thank you very much. Well, we're very glad to have you here. I'd, I'd like to start out by just getting a little bit more information about your backgrounds, who you are, where you grew up, and what brought you to find interest in the interesting subject of architecture and history here locally. So Susan, why don't we start out with you and give us a little bit of information about who you are. I was born and raised in Chicago in the center of the city. I went to a public high school and a public elementary school and one of the things we did in eighth grade was study Chicago architecture. So I developed an interest in, and that's m modern architecture like skyscrapers and things like that. So I had an interest in architecture from that and I grew up in a mid-century modern house from 1951, and the house I live in now in Ann Arbor is 1851, so I've made quite a journey. But I came here to go to school, to U of M, and I never left. And, what did you uh, study in school? I first studied um, Near Eastern Studies. I have a degree in that, and a master's degree and a bachelor's, and then I studied anthropology, and I was actually an archeologist, and I worked in Turkey for 10 seasons. And um, I got my ABD, and then I decided I'd had enough of school. <laughs> so I, um, I got interested in old buildings in Ann Arbor right from the sesquicentennial in 1974 and the bicentennial, 76, and then living in an old house. And I was between jobs, and I had nothing to do. And I thought, oh, maybe I'll try to find out more about the house I live in. And it was much older than I had expected. And I even tracked down the... It was the niece of the people who built the house, and she had lived in the country, and they wanted to send her to Ann Arbor High School, so she lived with her aunt and uncle. Hmm. And I tracked her down. She was living in Lurie Terrace, mm -hmm. and I got to interview her. So that was a lot of fun. I oh, found out, wow, that's, you know, um, whether they were growing, what they were growing around the house, and how, what the neighborhood was like, and things like mm -hmm. that. This was 311 East End, which is right opposite City Hall. Sure. And then I currently live at 712 East End, which is mm -hmm. on the other side of state. You've lived on Ann Street for 50 years. I have. <laughs> <laughs> wow, and before well, that, I lived on Elizabeth. And before that, I lived on Mary. Uh -huh. And my okay. mother said, what's with the women's names? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, Mom. Okay. Good question. <laughs> well, very interesting. Well, Patrick, you know, why don't you give us uh, where, where you fit in all this? Uh, you, you know, you're... Uh, not where you grew up, your background, and what you yeah, are. So I, I grew up in Salem and Superior Township, so I'm relatively mm -hmm. local. My dad's office was on Main Street. He was in politics here mm -hmm. in Ann Arbor growing up, Democratic Party. And um, I came, moved to Ann Arbor in 98 to come to U of M. Mm -hmm. And I had always um, worked on old houses my whole life. Um, mm -hmm. My dad was a teacher and had a painting business, so we were always in Ann Arbor working on these century old houses. And I, I think that's when I really got an appreciation for it, um, just w how these houses are special. Uh, but I also, at U of M, I studied history. So I've always kind of had that interest in the past. Um, I bought my first house in 2001, and I was only interested in buying a historic house. And so I bought a 1920s house in 2001. And then in 2004, I bought a 1910 house. And then in 2006, I bought an 1845 house, and now I'm in an 1840 house. Uh, they just keep getting older and older. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, basically when I came to U of M, I bought Susan's book, which was sort of the earlier version of Historic Ann Arbor. It was What's called that? Historic Buildings Ann Arbor, Michigan. Mm -hmm. And I just was walking, reading through that book that Susan wrote and I was like, oh my God, these buildings are so much older than I even knew we had in Michigan. They're 1820s and 30s. And um, that really taught me a lot about architecture. And then fast forward to 2006 when I bought my 1845 house, our, my friend Ed Rice, who is also friends with Susan, introduced us and it, he knew that Susan was interested in these very, very old houses. Mm -hmm. And uh, we got, 
to really know each other, researching my house on Pontiac Trail that I had bought mm -hmm. and uh, trying to find the crazy history of that, which yeah. was a, quite an epic undertaking. Yeah, his and, house uh, was moved. So that it was moved it and uh, had lots of interesting characters that lived there. And we really got to know right. each other mm -hmm. uh, during that process. And that sort of is what led to the historic uh, Ann Arbor and Architectural Guidebook is that researching of the house on Pontiac Trail. Huh. Well, and that does lead specifically to this book, and I'm just wondering, this was obviously a collaborative effort between the two of you. How did you differentiate between what, what roles each of you would play in terms of the composition, the writing, and so on? And, you know, I mean, collaborating in a book is hard enough, you know, with anything, but how did you, how did you di well, do the different Well, that's an interesting question, mm -hmm. because the previous book I wrote with someone who was 20 years older than me, Marjorie Reed, and she was updating a little pamphlet she had written. And so she updated the pamphlet, and I wrote the new entries. And for this, I updated the old book, and Patrick did the new entries. So that's how we split it up. Okay. And, Generally, you know, although there was quite a bit of collaboration yeah. on all of it. And uh, Susan and I, I don't know, we just have this really great research partnership. Yeah. We were good at bouncing ideas off of each other and, and pursuing things that the other one hadn't thought of, etc. So we have a really good partnership and a really good uh, rapport between us. Mm -hmm. And I think we, we work really well together in that way. So, so it wasn't really, it, was, it, it wasn't difficult mm -hmm. at all. Oh, that's wonderful. And I, I guess that, you know, you're very interested in historical houses and, and I guess the question is why? You know, a lot of people don't want to live in the past. What, why do you feel it's important for us to have some kind of a historical, historical buildings when the people say they're old, they crumble? Why don't we just put up a brand new beautiful <laughs> block? Why, what would you what would Well, first of all, we that? don't want to live in the past either. We are definitely <laughs> uh, very happy to live in modern times, although mm -hmm. there's many things to be <laughs> desired in our country that aren't going on right now. But um, I, for me personally, just working with these buildings hands-on was very informative about just the quality of construction, mm -hmm. something that's completely irreplaceable. You cannot build things out of wood anymore. You know, you can't have wood siding that's going to last for 150 or 200 years like some of these buildings have. And uh, just, it's, it's a completely irreplaceable resource. And the other thing I would just say too, before Susan goes, um, if every great city in America or the world has tried to preserve its historic buildings. There's something special about them, and I think everyone would agree when you're walking down Main Street, what is it about Main Street that's so special? It's those old 150-year-old buildings. Um, and there's some new ones in there, but the general character of that is given by the 150-year-old buildings that are on Main Street. And I think that's just an irreplaceable resource that um, really can only be can only be had from old buildings. You cannot, you cannot reproduce that in a new building. So I wrote down a lot, three things to say. <laughs> okay. one, one was there's an economic component to it, which mm -hmm. is that older buildings are more affordable. Mm -hmm. And if you're having an affordability crisis, which we are, it's, it's better to try to fix up the old buildings you have than replace them with new, because new is always more expensive. Yeah, the cost of new construction is The cost is of outrageous. new construction is. It's terrible. Then mm -hmm. there's an aesthetic to it, which is that they are mm, human-sized buildings that make it uh, encourage you to do things like walk and take walks in a neighborhood, and you know, pop in here, pop in there. And to me, most um, buildings, all buildings, are a form of public art. You look at this every day. And that's when you walk around, that's really all you see are buildings. It's very mm -hmm. r rare that you look at something else. And so to me, it's important that they're attractive. And I can't say that I like modern architecture, but I don't think what's going up in Ann Arbor now is terribly attractive. And it's also overwhelming the small character of the neighborhoods right abutting it. You know, you, a two-story house next to a 19-story building mm -hmm. doesn't, I don't think that's a good arrangement. And my third thing was that, you know, our, our past informs our, pr our present. And mm -hmm. we need to know where we came from, and we need the stories that buildings can tell. It's very hard to tell a story without the building. And that's like we use our museum on Main Street. That's the Historical Society. Mm -hmm. um, 
to tell the story of Washtenaw County and of building construction because it's a really old building. It's from 1830. It has three parts and they're all different, 35, five, I think, 37, yeah. and 39. Mm -hmm. So you can see yep. already mm -hmm. differences in construction techniques that mm -hmm. the people from New England were bringing with them, but then they were getting, uh, getting into new ways of uh, framing buildings, and you can see that there. Mm -hmm. And one of, one of the things that interested me about his house was that it had this old New England framing. Mm -hmm. And I went, uh, we always, we give our dog and pony mm -hmm. show, and I always mm -hmm. say, exposed corner posts, and you know, that's oh, sort sure. of, that's mm -hmm. what got me excited about his mm -hmm. house. Oh. Not too many people would get excited about that. But <laughs> we well, definitely do. But, well, the good news is we have a variety of actual interesting things to discuss when we get to that point in the show where we look at some actual buildings here in Ann Arbor. But then again, your love of history, your interest in history, not necessarily living in the past, but also honoring the past, uh, not everyone has that view. As you said, that we mm -hmm. people, modernity for a lot of folks is a 19-story building, and, the, mm -hmm. and uh, some people don't see that connection. I, I guess my thought would be you're very active in... I believe in the past, particularly with the Washtenaw County Historical Society, and I believe, yeah. why were, what was your interest in this organization and what, what function do they perform? This organization is a private organization. Mm -hmm. I've been active with this and a city organization, the mm -hmm. Historic District Commission. Sometimes people get them confused. Mm -hmm. But when I joined the board in the 80s, we didn't have a building, we didn't have a museum. Mm -hmm. We would just meet and have programs about historic topics and we wanted people to appreciate the history of Washtenaw County and preserve what they could of the important aspects of the county history. You know, agricultural practices and uh, various firsts that happened and things with the University of Michigan, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So in the, in the beginning, the Historical Society often was led by a professor from U of M. Mm. They were many of them who were presidents of the organization mm -hmm. but it had its uh, you know ebbed and flowed and and by the 50s it was a pretty a pretty moribund mm -hmm. but uh, we moved our house in 1990 from Wall Street mm -hmm. it was going to be demolished by the university for a parking structure which okay. is there now and they gave us the money to m they were going to use for demolition mm -hmm. that helped us move it and the city gave us a lot that had had a gas station on it and mm -hmm. had to be cleaned up so now we had our building to tell the story. Yeah. And mm -hmm. we've been telling the story with changing exhibits. And really great exhibits. We have, really, we have a really great mm -hmm. exhibit up right now. Well, okay. now w could you just tell folks where they, would, where they would go, what the specific address, where this, and the hours that they can come in the public to visit Okay, this? so it's at the corner of Main and Beaks, mm -hmm. 500 North Main. And we're open Saturdays and Sunday afternoons. Mm -hmm. We have a docent there who okay. gives tours. Mm -hmm. We have a gift shop sells a lot of books and other things and um, yeah we have a great exhibit now the ABC's of county history mm, that sounds interesting. And, uh, yeah. mm -hmm. Patrick I just wanted to check with you you live in a historic house you yes. studied history what are there any additional activities you're involved with here locally as far as the historical preservation are you more in terms of a st structured way or is it so just um, yeah so we're uh, both, the, uh, the book was published by a group called the Ann Arbor Historical Foundation, mm -hmm. and we're both involved in that. Um, I was on the Historic District Commission in, mm -hmm. uh, for six years, and the, actually I think that's an important distinction. People always talk about the historical society regulating what people can do with their buildings. It's actually totally different than that. It's the city has a historic district commission that regulates the buildings in their historic districts. Mm -hmm. And Susan and I were both involved in that for a long time. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was involved in that for a while. I also um, participate in the downtown street exhibit program. I don't know if you've seen the glass panels and the mm -hmm. historical exhibits oh, throughout great. town. Mm -hmm. uh, both Susan and I have been involved in that. Mm -hmm. um, and we do tours and, and stuff like that. And so, you were chair of the Germantown. Oh yeah, and I, I was uh, I was on two different historic district study committees too to create historic districts, neither of which were created. But yes, <laughs> that's they, were. A, they have to be approved another, by city council. They have council. to be approved by city council. So it, it all winds too. up being politics. Mm -hmm. Sure, well, <laughs> everything is political. I just had the mayor and his challenger on last week. So oh, okay. I'm quite familiar There's with lots the of politics. Of, of politics <laughs> going. All right. Well, that is interesting, and I guess that we're, before we move on to some of the most unique things that we have here, and bear with me, this is my first technical shot between getting these pictures up, and we're going to have our our guests discuss some of the various interesting uh, aspects of what we're going to show up. 
History, I, I certainly love history. I studied history in university when I was a student. I love the history of this town. I guess the question for both of you, having been observers as well as students of history and, and, and certainly of the love of history, what do you see are the real threats in this community, if any, to the historic preservation? Or how can we deal with any of the issues that you're confronting with when not necessarily that thought is coming, but where, where do you see historic preservation as an issue or as a going on in our community? What are the challenges we're going to be facing in the future as it relates to historic you preservation? Want to oh, yeah, well, just development. I, uh, that's obviously the, the biggest uh, detriment to any mm -hmm. historic neighborhood is when development encroaches on it. And that's pretty much happening, well, ev everywhere outside of our historic districts. Mm -hmm. So um, I think one place in particular where you're really seeing it right now is, say, the North Main area. A huge amount of development houses, single family houses being torn down for larger condo developments. Mm -hmm. And that's actually some of Ann Arbor's oldest houses are still up there. There's a few that uh, we're particularly worried about. But yeah, development, I think, is the biggest thing. And it, it's one of those things, too, you don't miss something till it's gone. And you don't realize what was there sometimes until it's gone. So Ann Arbor, I would say, has done a decent job in trying to protect many of its historic buildings through our, our nice historic districts. Um, Old West Side, for instance, is one of the first historic districts in America to basically just uh, protect vernacular or very simple working men's houses. Hmm. Um, so we've done a pretty decent job, but um, pretty much everywhere that's not in a historic district now is going to be probably subject to change and um, especially in the near downtown area near downtown neighborhoods the Susan mentioned the Germantown um, study committee that I was the chair of um, they just bulldozed uh, there was I think seven, seven seven century plus year old houses one of them was from the 1830s uh, homes of multiple Ann Arbor mayors were torn down just to build a really hideously ugly development um, and that, that, that is a political issue. It comes down to what uh, the community's values are and whether or not our city council thinks that these historic buildings are worth preserving. And that's what we've been fighting for that for years. Susan, much longer than me. Mm -hmm. um, but development is always going to be the number one thing. Mm -hmm. And it's yeah. not like we're anti-development, too. I no. mean, there, there's, you know, density is good and we do need new development. I'm a realtor, so I see huh? the need for housing <laughs> in the mm -hmm. city. There's a huge demand for it. But um, at what cost and you know at what cost to the things that we value as a city that's mm -hmm. the that's always going to be the the push and pull mm -hmm. so my my initial foray into this was to create what became the old fourth ward historic district and uh, I won't go into how I got there but I was on this you have to have a study committee there are state laws mm -hmm. regulating how you can form a district so you you form a study committee that the mayor appoints, mm -hmm. and then the study committee elects a chair, and then you study the neighborhood and you issue a report. And we have how many districts? 14, some of which are single buildings. <coughs> and mm -hmm. mm, the last four districts we have proposed have been turned down mm. by city council. And why, so, what, why would they do that? Because they perceive it as anti-development. Okay. And they don't want their hands tied. Um, but I, I, I really think that um, historic districts have done nothing but good for Ann Arbor. They've really, my neighborhood now, the old fourth ward, is a desirable place to live, and it's mostly students. Mm -hmm. But it looks so much better than it did when we moved in there. Mm -hmm. But um, it's still, you know, it's an uphill battle. And mm -hmm. another, another uh, uh, problem is the university can tear down anything it wants doesn't matter if it's a designated building in a district, they can still tear it down. Sure. Which they, actually one of the ones we're going to talk about is... Uh, okay, we're going to get that. <laughs> yeah, we'll get yes. to that. Okay. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, then again, I, it, I guess we're going to have a tour of some of the buildings that make Ann Arbor unique. Why don't you uh, give me an idea of what, what, is, what is this and give us a little bit of history on this. So this is 416 South Ashley Street, and uh, this is uh, the old uh, Toledo Ann Arbor Railroad Depot. And... Um, it's a very great, a very nice example of an 1880s railroad depot. I think this is 1889. Um, but the one thing I liked about it is that it's been repurposed. And that's a big thing in historic preservation, is if this building is no longer a railroad depot, what do you do with it? 
And in this case, it's a, a Montessori school, um, and I think it's been a Montessori school since uh, the 80s. Mm -hmm. uh, so a fantastic reuse of a historic building that maybe has lost the okay. need for its original purpose. And that's a big thing that we are always pushing for, is how do you reuse old buildings for modern mm -hmm. uses? And that's a, that's a big part of it, is reusing these old structures like this. Okay, well that's... Yeah, that was one of my points that I wanted to emphasize. Mm -hmm. We call it adaptive reuse. Mm -hmm. And we have many, many examples in Ann Arbor. This is what mm -hmm. everything that I okay. marked. Well, that, yeah, now that is certainly an interesting uh, building. Uh, let me go on to the next one here. If I can this. Well, um, I hope I know what it is. Well, I would think we, it's, it's all in, oh. uh, here we go. We're going right up. This is called, let's see, this is uh, this Avon. Is what is this 30 Avon. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk about it, Susan? Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. This was um, the first house that local architect Robert Metcalf designed for someone other than himself. Mm. And it was for uh, Professor Crane, who was in the physics department, and it was done in 1954. Mm. So and one thing that we uh, really tried to focus on in the new book, too, are newly historic buildings. And uh, when Susan wrote her earlier version of the book back in the mm -hmm. early 90s, these buildings were not quite historic yet. Mm -hmm. They were 30 or 40 years old. Yeah, you have so. to be 50 years old to be historic. Oh, that's encouraging. Officially. Oh, geez, uh, officially. That's so <laughs> a lot of these mid-century buildings, and Ann Arbor is mm -hmm. one of the hot spots mm -hmm. for mid-century modern architecture in but, Michigan. Mm -hmm. All right. But then what makes this special, I guess? I mean, I'm, you know, I, I guess you, you're saying it's mid-century modern. I mean, it's an interesting box design. We look at the windows. But how do, what distinguishes this from being something different than, let's say, a a 1950s 900 square foot uh, place on on Heather Crescent that looks exactly like every other <laughs> Or, you know, I'm just saying. What well, it's architect designed. It's okay, architect so it, designed. It's who designed it as opposed to yes. the, okay. All right. And, and, and <laughs> it's beautiful inside and out. Okay. Mm -hmm. And yep, the, the way he elements. arranged the rooms mm -hmm. is very interesting. The way he set up the kitchen is very interesting. Mm -hmm. And he had the children's bedrooms on one end of the house and the parents at the other. So they didn't bother each other. Mm -hmm. I mean, he did some unusual things. He did some unusual things with the bathrooms and getting light into mm -hmm. the, into the, from the ceiling, from skylights. Okay, so uh, I guess so that does somewhat distinguish. And, I, and as I think about when, going back, what you're saying that this is one of the first places that um, Metcalf um, that you did yeah. the uh, you had the old West Side working class. Mm -hmm. I, I'm mm -hmm. just wondering, you know, having also been a realtor in the past, uh, there's quite a, a, a similarity of houses on the other side of Miller, Hatcher, Crescent, mm -hmm. all of those. They're yeah. all yep. similar now. Why isn't that considered a, will that be potentially considered a historic district in 20 years? Or I mean, how do you distinguish the fact that the German immigrants in the Fourth Ward with their 1920s, you know, A-frame houses <laughs> well, with one bathroom on the second floor, what, what, what's the difference this between isn't, This isn't imposed on these neighborhoods from above. Mm -hmm. The neighbors decide they want a historic district because they're worried about preserving the integrity of their neighborhood. So if I lived on Hatcher Crescent yes, in a exactly. 900 square, yes. if I wanted it to if be If you wanted some, it, you get your, we just passed another district, just passed, mm -hmm. of 1950s houses. In Ann Arbor Township. In, yeah, in Ann Arbor Township, but it, everybody thinks it's Ann Arbor. It's on oh. Thorn Oak Drive, and most of the houses there are from the 50s and 60s, okay. and were designed by one or two architects, and the neighbors themselves decided they wanted a historic district because New people were moving in and tearing down the old houses, oh, and they didn't. And they okay. um, were upset about that. And they, you have to get a certain percentage of your neighbors to agree before they will let you proceed with a study committee. And you would say there would be an economic benefit to a community that decides to go historic. Um, yeah, because you can then qualify for tax credits. Oh well. <laughs> okay. Well, the um, and, and two, it, it just it ha it's the only way you can really protect the sense of place. There are, yeah. are there's no other way to do it. I mean, there are zoning restrictions, but they're not going to protect the character of the neighborhood. Historic districts are pretty much the only tool that neighbors have available to them if if their interest is preserving the overall character of the neighborhood. And again, the main, well, the the most important aspect is you must be a neighborhood that is 50, 50. years old. Mm -hmm. So if, let's see, 50, so yeah. my house on Yellowstone Drive in Maplewood isn't there yet. Okay. <laughs> or that neighborhood of Maplewood, Orchard Hills, Bromley, the uh -huh. But theoretically, if people want to conserve the character, so I guess the assumption would be if, if particularly in Ann Arbor, where peop, the the lots are almost becoming as 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 valuable as the homes, exactly. th there's a danger there, mm -hmm. right? Yes. From, your, from exactly, especially the small mid-century modern houses, 
are the ones that that oh, are targeted. Okay. Yep. And one, we also belong to a group called A2 Modern. And mm -hmm. A2 Modern focuses on mid-century modern houses. And we, we are, we have not emphasized being a historic district, but there are many people in that neighborhood who started A2 Modern because of this problem okay. of people moving in and tearing down the houses and mm -hmm. building really big things that don't fit in and that uh -huh. people, people don't like. Mm -hmm. But I don't think they would attempt a historic district there because... Well, you mean Ann Arbor Hills? Ann Arbor Hills. Yeah. Ann Arbor Hills. Actually, there was a conference, a statewide conference that was held in Ann Arbor, and one of the people was leading a tour through that neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And one of the guys who's from the State Historic Preservation Office was on the tour. And afterwards, he said, this is the best collection of mid-century modern houses I've ever seen. I had no idea Ann Arbor was so important. Mm -hmm. And then we've developed a website where you can read about all the important architects from the 50s mm. and 60s who were students of Metcalf, who was in turn a student of Brigham. And those are the two big names. And people always want houses by those two guys. And the, the history of these houses, too, is interesting because it's t very much tied to the University of Michigan and all of this talent, basically in the 19th, yeah. starting in the mm. 40s, started coming to Ann Arbor to mm. teach at the U of M. Yeah, and they were coming from New York. They were coming California. from New York. Yeah. These were people that were te taught by some of the greatest architects in the world mm -hmm. and turned out to be great architects in their own right. And then they were just, in addition to teaching, they were designing homes for their friends. They were designing homes for other people in the department, designing their own homes. So oh, okay. Ann Arbor's a really mm -hmm. uh, a hotbed of mid-century mm -hmm. modern And it was this state official's statement that, got, that really spurred us to do this, to create a group advocating for mid-century modern. So we have tours of mid-century mm -hmm. modern houses that anyone can go to. And we have lectures. And we have um, a website Good. with, well, with well, all we'll this give information. That to, we'll give that at the bottom okay. for folks who want to see sure. it. All right, well, here we go. Let's move on to this place. OK, so this is uh, 1000 Berkshire. This is kind of on the edge of Ann Arbor Hills there. Uh, built in 1932 uh, for uh, Harry and Margaret Towsley. Mm -hmm. uh, and this was. This is Ann Arbor's first, considered first mid-century modern building, and it was built in 1932, so quite early, uh, designed by Alden Dow. Do you want to say anything about it, Susan? Well, Alden Dow was the architect laureate of the state of Michigan, mm -hmm. and his home and studio in Midland, he's part of the Dow chemical family. Okay. They, mm -hmm. um, he studied with Frank Lloyd Wright, and there are Frank Lloyd Wright influences in, in what mm. he produced. He did a lot of public buildings in Ann Arbor, City he, Hall. He did City Hall and the Public Library, mm -hmm. and then he did a lot of buildings on the campus, um, the CCRB and Fleming, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and uh, ISR building. So yeah. he was a, he was a very well known architect in his own mm -hmm. right, and his his home and studio are now in the National Register. Anyway, my, Mrs. Towsley was his sister, mm -hmm. and he designed a house for her and for two other people. He didn't do a lot of houses in Ann Arbor, so. Mm -hmm. Uh, this was also purported to be the first house in the United States with an attached garage. Facing the street. Facing the street. Oh, well. So that's its cl another claim to well, make. We've <laughs> certainly made up for it in the interim. Yes, there have been <laughs> uh, really, since then. Know, now so. now the, the, the garage is what you see sometimes. Mm -hmm. Before you see the door, right. the garage is sticking out. All right, well, let's see. That was, and I think the next one is, well, we have this one, which I'm sure it would be very familiar to everybody. Ah. What's so exciting about the Burton Tower? Well, it's only on the cover of every publication <laughs> about Ann Arbor and the University of Michigan. Mm -hmm. It's an iconic building. Mm -hmm. and uh, designed by Albert Kahn, who is sure. one of the most important architects of the 20th century. And it's next to Albert Kahn's Hill Auditorium. Mm -hmm. And in the foreground is a sculpture by the famous Swedish architect Carl Millis, who taught at Cranbrook for 35 years. Mm. And Carl Millis is um, well known around the world for his sculptures. Mm -hmm. And there's a carillon behind the clock that was paid for by Mr. Baird. So it's Burton Tower in honor of uh, a former a president of the university who died mm -hmm. suddenly. And then Baird was head of athletics, I think. Mm -hmm. He paid to have this carillon put in there mm -hmm. from uh, England. So the bells chime the. Uh, every 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. We have Westminster chimes. And then they have concerts um, at noon where they play lots of music. I live two blocks away from there, so I hear the bells a lot. But it's, um, 
Mm -hmm. What's the date of that? 36? I think 36, not 36 or 38. Mm -hmm. So, and it's also a great example of Art Deco architecture. Sure. Mm -hmm. It's fabulous. Mm -hmm. well, it, is, it is wonderful. Uh, all right, well, let's see what we have next. We are got the, this is the, um, it says Chapin. What, what's the history okay, of Okay, this? this is 115 <coughs> Chapin Street. Um, the thing that I liked about this house is that it's kind of unassuming from the street. You wouldn't think anything special is going on there unless you're an architecture buff and you can see it's an older Greek Revival style house. Um, but this was built by um, Sylvester and Europia Chapin in 1846. Now the cool thing about this house is that this was a stop on the Underground Railroad. Um, and the Chapin brothers, I think there was three Chapin brothers that lived in town, they had greenhouses on Chapin Street there, um, or did I say the, the Noble Brothers, I'm sorry, yeah. the Noble Brothers, Noble. sorry. Noble, yeah, so I was wondering about that. Uh, yeah, sorry about that. The Noble Brothers, they had greenhouses on Chapin, which was just a dirt path at the time, and they were uh, basically harboring runaway slaves there until 1850 when the Fugitive Slave Law was passed, and that meant that Basically, it was very, very, very illegal to harbor uh, runaway slaves. Mm -hmm. And so the slaves that they had that had run away that were working in their greenhouses had to flee to Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, chief, uh, the, uh, the Noble Brothers also helped other slaves escape uh, to freedom in Canada. So Ann Arbor was a hotbed of the abolitionist movement, and uh, there were many houses that were on the Underground Railroad. This is one of the few in the city limits that we actually know was uh, part of that. Hmm. Well, that's, that's wonderful. Uh, now again, with the, with the future, where do they, if there's, they're after them, are there certain, where do they hide these folks? Do so there oftentimes areas? they were hidden in plain sight. I mean, okay. that's the thing that I think people always think there's going to be hidden chambers and mm -hmm. things like that where the slaves were hidden. Now that was common, especially along the Ohio River where, you know, the slave catchers were hot on their trail. A lot of times they were just hidden in barns and things like that okay. on the property. So or the, the kind of the secret room aspect is, uh, is a myth in the most It's not instances? a myth, but it's, it's, not as con it's not necessary, I guess, to the story. Because mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times they were just hidden in barns and then taken secretly at night to the Detroit River where they would cross into Canada. To yeah, they weren't, they weren't staying very long. They right, would... sure. Mm -hmm. And the other thing, too, is a lot of the neighbors knew this was going on. Right. So um, you actually have... Uh, Marshals and sheriffs and uh, justices of the peace were required to arrest runaway mm -hmm. slaves and return them to slavery, but a lot of times they didn't participate, or neighbors would break them out of jail and stuff like that. Interesting. So it, a lot of it had to do with, you know, they were in relatively friendly territory here. Mm -hmm. How about this place? Okay, well, so this is uh, 1014, or this was 1014 mm -hmm. Cornwell uh, in the Old Fourth Ward Historic District, and um, this was actually torn down a few years ago. So it's the, okay. one of the few buildings in our book that's been torn down since the, the book was beautiful. published. That's beautiful. Why did they tear it down? And that's in the Old Fourth Ward mm -hmm. Historic District, but it was owned by the university. And without any warning, they tore it down. Yep, and, and I think it's just a parking a lot. A friend of ours who walks her dog there emailed me and said, they just tore down the George Dock House. And so we called them up and read them the Riot Act and said, if you're going to do this, at least get a, let us get in there and document it and photograph it. And they have been very good about that now since this happened. Mm. I, we um, just are documented a building on Wall Street, the last house on Wall Street, and also an 1840s house that they're going to demolish soon. Boy, the place looks like it was a kept, well kept. It, it was. Just, it's it a just, beautiful, really classic a, example of the Queen that's Anne sad. style. That's yeah. that's, so that's gone. Well, so this is always uh, the problem with U of M here in town is they don't have to follow our local laws, including <laughs> our historic district ordinance. So that is uh, the whole town and gown divide has uh, always been an issue. And uh, this is just one more aspect of it. So now they're, they're mm -hmm. contacting me in a former ar mm -hmm. uh, an architect who worked with Quinn Evans, which is a local architecture firm specializing in historic preservation. Mm -hmm. And she and I are called to do any building they're tearing down, even if it's not a historic building. Mm -hmm. Like right in the future, there's going to be an addition to the power plant at the mm -hmm. curve of right. Washington and Huron. And so we're going to be involved in that. And mm -hmm. at least she is. 
Okay. Right. Well, that, that just, I mean, again, yeah, I just so think it's, it's I mean, even you yeah. could say this is tragic that they tore even that down. Me. I mean, you know, I mean, this is, I believe in progress, but, you know. This is, a, this is what we were trying to get at, you know. Yeah. Well, you that, just, I think that's a clearly an example. I mean, I just, that's. It's just sad, and it all goes into the landfill, sad. too. It's, yeah. It and, just, you know, it's just not a sustainable way to behave. So I'm, I'm against demolition of, of anything, almost. All right, well, well almost moving anything. along, uh, what about, um, <laughs> we have this, this should be very familiar. This, what's this? Ah, uh, yes, the uh, Michigan Central Depot mm -hmm. at 401 Depot Street, built in 1889, a really classic example of the uh, Richardsonian Romanesque mm -hmm. style of architecture. Susan, do you want to add about it? Because this is also a great adaptive reuse of an old Yeah, place. this is part, one of the adaptive reuse buildings that I selected to, mm -hmm. to want to talk about. And this is what can you do with an mm -hmm. old train station. And right. Chuck Muir had the, the vision to see this as a restaurant. Mm -hmm. So when the station ended its service in 1968, he bought it. And he created the Gandhi Dancer restaurant here, which emphasized seafood. It also mm -hmm. emphasizes that it's a railroad station. So mm -hmm. when you go in, it's not trying to be something it isn't. And everyone claps when the train comes through. And they have original things from the Detroit station that is now going to be renovated by Ford Motor Company. Mm -hmm. So they have some lamps in there. Anyway, they pr the Gandy Dancer is a railroad term. So mm -hmm. they really played up that part of it. And they, mm -hmm. and they restored it. Um, I remember in, um, there was a sign that had faced the tracks. And it was in this squiggly text that was very popular in the 1880s. And then it had an arrow. And one direction said Detroit, and the other said Chicago. And it gave the mm -hmm. mileage. Mm -hmm. And someone liberated the sign. That's what we used to say in the 70s. <laughs> and it, for the 100th anniversary of, of it, Chuck Muir said he would like the sign back, no questions asked. And he got the sign back. And then he asked us, the HDC, what, where he should put it, because if he put it in front, mm -hmm. then it's pointing the wrong way. Right. And if he puts it out there by the tracks, no one will see it. And, mm -hmm. and I said, um, put it inside. It's a work of art. Mm -hmm. So it is inside, <laughs> and it mm -hmm. hangs over the fireplace. And mm -hmm. I just remember he said, I love the HDC. No one ever says that. So <laughs> okay. That's well, why I they, remember now, now they do. And poor Chuck Muir mm -hmm. died in a terrible uh, um, sailing event. Mm. He, off the coast of Florida, just mm. disappeared. Mm, that's horrible. It was, mm, mm. It's bad. All right. Well, well, mm. we certainly this is a familiar open. What, what are you yeah. going to tell us about this this Ann Arbor landmark? Well, <laughs> so this has been a grocery. Uh, it, food has been sold here since it was built in 1902 as Desterides. Uh, was it Desterides? Yeah. Yeah, Desterides, and then it was um, Dyroffs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Desterides, there were. They were Italians hmm. who uh, first ran this grocery store and sweet shop, and it, it catered to the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And it became Zingerman's in about 1983. Yes, exactly, 1983, because it catered my wedding, and it was a year before my wedding. Mm -hmm. uh, be and before that, it had been another grocery store with a Mr. Whipple-type character, if anybody mm -hmm. remembers mm -hmm. Mr. Whipple, Don't Squeeze the Charmin. I mean, it was a bald guy with a white mm -hmm. apron, <laughs> big stomach, and that was Mr. Dyroff. And mm. he catered to the black community there. Mm -hmm. This became a black neighborhood, became right. the on only neighborhood blacks could buy property in. Mm. And so there were collard greens on Saturday and these big mm -hmm. overflowing bags and frozen possum and uh, mm -hmm. rabbits and mm -hmm. things you didn't find in other stores mm -hmm. but I used to I used to go there I shopped there a lot but so mm -hmm. uh, the one thing yeah. I would just point out is it's a fairly simple building but what we tried to do when we were picking built picking the buildings that went into the book the 375 mm -hmm. that actually made the cut uh, was a challenge and so mm -hmm. one of the things we definitely try to do is is highlight things that were not only historic but maybe had some current cultural okay. significance mm -hmm. uh, or right. people would uh, say, oh, I always wondered about the history of that building. Mm -hmm. And because Zingerman's is such a landmark in town sure. here. It's, mm -hmm. it's not only a, a great historic building, but mm -hmm. you know, Zingerman's is creating its own history there now mm -hmm. as one of the great Absolutely. food destinations in America. Mm -hmm. So uh, um, a man named Milo Ryan, who grew up a block away, wrote a book about growing up in this neighborhood mm -hmm. in the teens and 20s. Mm. And he talks about going to Desiderides and getting candy and mm -hmm. the train. And the, mm -hmm. There was a trolley running down Detroit Street. Right. And if you are in front of the Treasure Mart, you can see where the bricks were filled in, where the tracks were. They're mm -hmm. a different color. Right. So mm -hmm. that's kind of fun to talk about. Mm -hmm. Sure. 
All right, well, there's, uh, let's move on to the next one. This is, maybe as historians, I mean, I've asked this of other people who have been on this show, and I, and I don't get the answer, but this is on Division Street. Yes. Corner of Division and Ann. And the question I always ask is, what does, does anybody know what the origin of the word division is? Division dividing between yes. what? What is that? You. Oh, I, I, I find some you. historians that know. Please <laughs> enlighten me with what that it means. It was the boundary between the city of Ann Arbor and Ann Arbor Township. Oh, I can see. I, I've so heard people when, say it's division between the university community no. and the townies. Also, when that house stories. was built, it was not in the city of Ann Arbor. Oh, that's true. Okay. It was outside the city limits. That's where the city limits ended. So it's the division of the city because it's mm -hmm. I mean, it became part of the township pretty quickly. Yeah, it was. It became but, part of the city. City, like I mean, very early. Very you know, early. In the, probably in the 1840s, it, I think, or 18. Yeah, mm, it was yeah. early. It was, it was early. early, but that. But I guess Lee and Amber was. And really there's an older building behind it. The okay. first building, that lower building, was from the 1830s. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. And then a judge built this on the front right. in, yeah. in the mid 1840s. Judge Wilson built well, it in 1840. Well, this certainly has some obviously the Greek column view to yeah. it. But what, what this? I mean, everyone sees this when you go down. What's what's so interesting about this place? So this, um, and it, it's interesting too, because the current mm -hmm. owners, uh, Norm and Eileen Tyler, have written a book just on this house and studying uh -huh. the architectural heritage of what led to the construction of this house. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's considered by many to be one of the greatest Greek Revival buildings in all of America. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Greek Revival architecture was the predominant style when Ann Arbor was founded in the 1820s mm -hmm. into the 18, basically into the Civil War. And uh, this is considered one of the finest examples in the entire state and also in the country. And um, its proportions are noted to be perfect mm. in the classical sense. You know, the Greeks were obsessed with class, uh, perfect proportions, and uh, the proportions of this were are considered to be quite uh, close to perfect. Mm. Um, and it's just it's a it's a really uh, it, for most of the Greek Revival architecture in town is not this uh, stunning or architecturally sure. significant. Mm. So it's it's a rare survivor of a type of uh, of Greek Revival that was built. Ex extensively mm -hmm. throughout New York State. So, so in mm -hmm. their book, they discover the prototype for this building mm -hmm. in Greece. Okay. And the reason Greek Revival architecture was so popular was because the Greeks had just won their independence from Turkey, mm -hmm. from the Ottoman Empire in the 1820s. And so Greek Revival architecture was to people, building houses, an expression of democracy, the new democracy of America. Right. Well. So, <laughs> Well, I mean, obviously those columns are all over Washington, and I mean, yes. is, is, the, is, the, is the, the Greek revival the fact that this has a similarity to the, to the Parthenon, Parthenon yes. in, in, exactly. in Athens? Exactly. Mm -hmm. exactly. It isn't the, quite the Parthenon, it's another temple they found. Okay. They found the prototype, it doesn't exist anymore, but they found uh, people who had gone to Athens mm -hmm. in the 18th century found, uh, drew mm -hmm. what this house is. Oh, after. really? Oh, that's interesting. And actually, a lot of the stuff you see in Washington, D.C. is more of a Roman precedent. Hmm. Yeah. Thomas mm -hmm. Jefferson was, Greek architecture really hadn't been discovered, and this is something I learned in Norman Eileen's hmm. book mm -hmm. uh, that they wrote on this house, is that Greek architecture, because Greek w Greece was closed off when the Turks ran it, nobody had gotten in there really to oh, examine wow, it very sure. closely. Mm -hmm. And so uh, a lot of the earlier classical uh, architecture that was built in America was of a Roman precedent, but by the time mm -hmm. uh, this was built, clearly they were looking back to ancient Greece and mm -hmm. that kind of muscular, uh, muscular classical style. Mm -hmm. I think Jefferson was inspired by a, a Roman temple that was in France. Ah, okay. That he, when he was the minister to France, so there were mm -hmm. scattered Roman buildings all over Europe, just, not just in Italy, hmm. and they, and in England too. Mm -hmm. I don't know what's left of Roman buildings in England. But, All right. You know. Well, here we go with another, uh, ah. you know, building. I mean, you're right. I mean, I guess you know when you look at these, I think we do take it for granted. I mean, when do you know when was this thing built? I mean, I think there's something so on the top there. This yeah. is interesting. So the date stone on top, I think, is 1899, 1899. which is not accurate. It's oh. uh, well, well that's the date of the facade. The facade was the changed. The building behind it is. Older. 1874. Older. The building was built. Uh, this is called the Kaiser Block. Mm -hmm or Kaiser, I guess you would say it. Um, yeah. But the interesting <coughs> part of its history um, is that in the 1920s it became uh, the Colored Welfare League. Hmm. And in the 1920s there was the Great Migration, mm -hmm. uh, large numbers of African Americans moving up from the South. Ann Arbor always had a 
decently sized African American community going back to the pre-Civil War years. Uh, but really in the 20th century, the, the population grew and this Carytown, Old Fourth Ward area became the epicenter of the African American community. And the Color Welfare League was set up in this building um, and helped, uh, helped African Americans with housing, which was a difficult issue because Ann Arbor was very segregated back then. Sure, yeah. And actually in my real estate dealings, I occasionally will come upon a deed that says, you're not allowed to sell this to somebody of you know, African descent. Wow. Uh, and this is going into the 1940s and 50s oh, when it sure. was uh, mm -hmm. outlawed. Um, so housing was a very difficult issue and this was sort of one of the epicenters of the African American community. And to this day, they have the African American Festival right in front of this, okay. this building. Good, because I, I just for people who don't know, this is actually not too far from the Zingermans, which we also right. discussed, had mm -hmm. that grocery store. So this is all mm -hmm. in, somewhat adjacent to. Um, and you also have two historic mm -hmm. African American churches in that neighborhood. You know, it, it's uh, the, the 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 character of the neighborhood has changed significantly, and mm -hmm. it's not very. Uh, there's not that many African Americans that still live there, but. Uh, Historically, that's what uh, it, that was the whole melting pot of Ann Arbor. That whole neighborhood mm -hmm. surrounding and, it, and that's where a lot of ethnic groups went, like Greeks, the Irish, the and Greeks, the, Irish, the, Italians. And the Italians. So they come in and then take off. Yeah. After the integration, I mean, well, that whole neighborhood down there by Carytown, mm -hmm. I always say it wasn't necessarily a desirable place to live. There were factories everywhere, oh, uh, the railroad, slaughterhouses. It was kind of the cheap part of town. So a lot of the Irish and the Italians and the African Americans, when they first got here, they settled there because it was cheaper. So the the concept of living close to downtown that people yes. have here that you'll pay more was certainly oh, yeah. not the view. No, of no. Oh yeah, not That's until, very not until fairly recently. That's like in the last mm -hmm. ten years. <laughs> All right, here we go. We're moving on to something obviously uh -huh. a little bit All right, this is, this is uh, 2151 Heather Way from 1953. Susan, you want to talk about that? Uh, it was designed by William Mooch and Oh, yeah. So uh, this is also like in the, in the very epicenter mm -hmm. of mid-century modern. Uh, yeah, Ann Arbor Hills. Ann Arbor Hills. Heather Way is, is where in Ann Arbor? Where it's on Heather Way. Is that Ann Arbor Hills? Where is that? Yes. Yeah, kind of off Ann of Arbor Hills. It's east of Washtenaw. Okay, yeah. Um, mm -hmm between Geddes and um, Stadium, kind of. Yeah, uh, so, so this was actually designed by William Muchenheim for himself. Um, apparently there are like 13 levels was, in the house or something was, like um, that. He was a New Yorker, mm -hmm. I believe, who was, had been writing articles for the Life magazine and things like that. And he got lured to be on the faculty of the University oh, of Michigan. Okay. Mm -hmm. So he was one of the stars at the mm. University of Michigan, and in this house, mm -hmm. so unusual, mm -hmm. uh, and the doors are all painted bright colors. Hmm. And it's they, kind of built into the hillside, so you don't even get a sense for, from the front how big it is. It, yeah, it's sort if of, you go in the back, you can see more, and I mean, he lived there until he died. I it's believe. a really, it's just, it's, mm -hmm. it sticks out like a sore thumb, even among the mid-century buildings. Mm -hmm. That's why we thought it was so fascinating. Yeah, it's it's it just so unique. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and everybody comes on and says, what's that? <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's very interesting. What is that? Um, and we're going to moving along here. Now here we're, we've got the fourth governor here, and here we go. Let's see. I guess to see if we got this one and see what you think of this place. Oh, that's interesting. Uh. What is that? Okay, so this is the uh, Silas Douglas House. The address on this one is um, 503 East Huron. Is it 503? I've lost my Click place here. It's on East Huron, kind of near Division. 502. 502 East Huron. Uh, it was built in 1845 mm -hmm. with various additions. Now, the interesting thing about this house is, number one, it's Gothic Revival, which is not that common in Ann Arbor or anywhere for that matter, except for maybe certain places in Ontario. And, and uh, the Gothic part is that it has a steep roof. Mm -hmm. And then over the porch, it's got pointed arches, mm -hmm. not round. And so the other the thing that's really interesting about this house is this is noted to be the first house in all of Ann Arbor to be designed by an architect. Hmm. In 1845, there were yeah. architects here, or at least ones in Detroit that were practicing out here. So like the Greek Revival House, we don't know who the architect was. So, but we do for this one. And hmm. so, in the, you know, most houses were just built by Built. Carpenters, mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just designed by carpenters, and uh, and they had pattern books that they brought with them from New England mm -hmm. quite often. Now it's interesting to me, as I'm looking at this, is that 
I mean, obviously, whoever owns this, there's certainly, you, you talked about how it's cheaper at one level for an older house, but you, these, somebody's putting money into these things. Oh, that's things owned by the church. Too. Yeah, the Baptist church next door owns oh, that. Oh, so they, is, it, is, it, is, it, is it like a, a parish house? Yes, yeah. oh, so it's the a minister, parish the minister house, lives there? And the minister lives there, and the students mm -hmm. live there. Some students mm -hmm. that they sponsor, like from foreign countries, for example. Mm -hmm. And they spent a lot of money to restore that porch. Oh, well, that, it's just, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, well here, let's move on. This oh, is Patrick. Uh, this is your, one of your favorites. Oh, okay. I love this building. <laughs> uh, it just sort of looks like it should be in like Jane Austen's England or something. Mm -hmm. um, it's sort of uh, reminiscent of, of uh, classical follies. They call them mm -hmm. in in England. You'd have these. Uh, they're called follies. I don't know why, where that name comes from, but they would just be yes. built on a grand whimsical, estate. Whimsical, whimsical. Yeah, very whimsical. Uh, this was built as a bathroom. In 1914, for Island Park, which is one of Ann Arbor's earliest uh, mm -hmm. city parks. Again, that's over by the uh, University Hospital area. Yeah, right, right across from kind of the Kellogg Eye Center. Mm -hmm. um, it's on Island Park, and um, it's no longer used as bathrooms. It's just sort of like a shelter now. Um, but uh, it was uh, built by the Cook Brothers hmm. in Ann Arbor that were local builders. Was it 1915 or 1914, something? I believe. 14? And uh, just a really mm -hmm. fantastic example of, I've always been interested in buildings that are functional yet architecturally appealing. Mm -hmm. and, this and, is, and, and another interesting thing is that this was when we were just starting to create our parks department. Mm -hmm. That was the beginning of the Ann Arbor Park system. So they were building really nice stuff like this at the beginning of and, the... Well, and again, I, they, they certainly are, are uh, it's a little bit more elaborate than most yes. of the uh, and people facilities. Have wedding, people have wet, had, had weddings there. Mm -hmm. in, yes. In, in, oh, really? Under, in the former in the, bathroom. In the, well, not in the bathroom. <laughs> okay. No, it was an open space, <laughs> and there are bathrooms on either side. But, uh, but as I said, they, they... But you stand between the columns, and the minister will stand up mm -hmm. there, whoever's marrying you. Well, and it's a very lovely setting. Yep, be on an island. Sort of yeah. in my backyard, a couple blocks down the hill, and uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I just like walking walking over there. It's just a beautiful setting with the river kind of flowing around the oh, island. Oh yeah, no, and, it uh, is a it is a lovely area. But I didn't really. So this was almost. Glen Arbor has a history of a lot of the parks. You know, we have more parks in a lot of regions. This sense of civic. Yeah, absolutely. That goes, that. that goes way yeah, back. That goes way and back. Is so this Ann public Arbor, dollars when they built this? Yes. yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So Ann Arbor, um, going back to the late 1800s when they first started putting the, the first city parks in, mm -hmm. uh, we, we're fairly pro we've always been a fairly progressive city in that way. You know, public mm -hmm. spaces. Um, it was cut part of the city beautiful movement that was going mm -hmm. on at the time. So Ann sure. Arbor was fairly progressive. And uh, Again, put its money where its mouth is. And in, in, in the 60s, when uh, Detroit Edison was selling off all their mm -hmm. land, Ann Arbor bought it to right. turn it into the park system we enjoy today. So, mm -hmm. Great. Well, look at this little quaint thing. What's yeah. this? So this is, um, the reason I selected this one is because, um, ignore all that stuff in the back. That was all a later addition. But uh, this is sort of one of the houses, I think, that makes the Old West Side Historic District special. Now. In any other city, this probably would have been torn down long ago or remodeled beyond recognition. It's a very rare survivor of an early, um, the, the type of house that was common early in Ann Arbor's history. So this was built in around 1850 by the Kuhn family. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was basically a two-room house with a sleeping loft when it was originally mm -hmm. built. Mm -hmm. And apparently there were 10 people living there. It's a rather uh, intimate setting. Two yes. adults and eight children. Yeah, two adults and eight children. Mm -hmm. And. Um, the, this is part of what makes the Old West Side so special is that these buildings were preserved. Mm -hmm. And um, and again, there's just so few around that were th this tiny type of structure mm -hmm. that was built by the, the thousands when Michigan was settled. Very few are surviving. Now, the in other interesting thing I'll point out about this is that in the historic district, everything is regulated in terms of what you can do. And they came to a really nice solution uh, to the poor people that lived there that really wanted a little more space. Mm -hmm. So they put this uh, kind of interesting barn-like attached addition on mm -hmm. the back that uh, works really well with the architecture, doesn't detract from the original building, and gives the people a little more space to uh, to breathe in there. OK, so actually, so interestingly, the they kept the original shell of this, which you know, basically is a foyer, foyer, I assume, into the larger it's house little, behind it. Is that how it? Well, I'm what, not sure about it. Um, I don't know what they Because that looks like a rather large structure in the back. It's rather large, yes. Mm -hmm. um, but again, in a in a small building like that, it, it was sort of a good solution to try to add on without. And, and that's that is, as you said, being creative when it comes to historical properties. Because I have to be honest. 
uh, that's rather small, and I, I mean, for, for today's standards. Uh, absolutely. And I would think the idea that you could make it not only hold on to that, but then also mm -hmm. inculcate a little bit more of the breathing space, right. to say right. the least, if you got eight kids, I don't think that was going to work <laughs> no, there. I just, when we take people on tours, we use this as an example mm -hmm. of what it was like to live in the 19th century, and that people had, they la had a sleeping loft and kids slept four to a bed, mm -hmm. and that was just normal. Kuhn is spelled K-U-H-N, by the way, mm -hmm. and it, this is one of the early German families, and we have their records at the Bentley Library, so that's mm -hmm. how we know more about uh, the family than we would normally know. The other thing, I wanted to correct something Patrick said. He mm -hmm. said you, the Historic District Con Commission controls everything. They control everything on the exterior. Yes. You can do anything you want on the inside. Sure. Mm -hmm. So no, no, people are go. scared of historic districts well, because I guess, they you know, think that. They hey, Americans don't like being told what to do. Right. Well, Until I mean, your neighbor bulldozes their house <laughs> and builds a giant monstrosity next to your an apartment building, which is actually, so this next one is uh, Mulholland Street, which is the old West Side Historic that's, District. Isn't that, I'm trying to think, is that, is that near Sunset? Is it? No, it, is, it runs between um, uh, uh, Liberty and Washington, Mulholland and Murray Streets. Okay. We feature both of them in the All book. Right. I mean, this, this, is the, this style is the whole side, as far as I can yep. see. Exactly. Right? Mm -hmm. Kind of a German vernacular mm -hmm. uh, working man's house. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, Built all at once. Built, for, yeah, for, they're going for about seven hundred thousand. By the are way, they right really? now, oh, uh, yeah, Street. maybe uh, five, yeah, four or five. <laughs> they're pretty expensive, uh, these <laughs> ones. But uh, it, that's one of the more desirable streets in Ann Arbor because people want to live on a street that looks like that. I mean, they're not they're not snapping up these houses at high prices because they're a thousand square feet. Sure. They're snapping them up because they're. It's the, one of the most beautiful streets in Ann Arbor, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, it's only one block long, right? Or it's two? about one, yeah, one and two a half, something half. like that. Uh, and then Murray Street is behind right. Mulholland here. Um, uh, they're all the same design, right? Yes, so, pretty okay. much. So here's the interesting thing mm -hmm. about these, is that they're all the same design, mm -hmm. but they were clearly not built from a plan because they all vary ever so slightly in terms of the dimension, huh. the height, the window placement varies mm -hmm. ever so slightly but they're all um, basically built from carpenter memory, I would say. And so that's mm. the, the classic definition of a vernacular home, is mm. that it was just built by carpenter memory based on a plan, mm -hmm. uh, a basic plan that you know, isn't even necessarily written down anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and these are all over the Old West Side. Right, this was yeah. the most common style in the early 1900s mm -hmm. that was built basically up and through uh, 1920 or so. Sure. I think uh, these stopped being built around 1920. Well, and you know, just from a practical point of view, and, I, and again, I don't know how they offset this because this would be the concern for someone who wanted to get one of these. When these were made, they had one bathroom and they were on the second floor. Mm -hmm. Now, if I had one of these, uh, you know, you don't want to crawl up the stairs. Uh, can you add something to the back? How do they, how do they deal with that in today's yeah, world? So is that a, most is that of these an issue? do have additions on them, actually. Yeah. Because, because as you know, I mean, if you know, I know the design of this house. You've got it it's in the all front row. and the back. Mm -hmm. Upstairs is one bathroom in the middle yep. between two rooms. Yes, at the top of the stairs. And I don't know about you, but most people in today's world aren't necessarily interested in climbing the stairs to go to the bathroom. That's right. That is true. So and they the, do. They have additions. I, and then that's. Have it. You Would ever, that be allowed? Hmm? Have you ever? Of course. Of and course, and yeah. um, have you ever been on the Old West Side Home Store? No. Oh, you should go one year because you can see how people have done, they have done how that. they've upgraded the houses for modern living. Because that's mm -hmm. what they like to show off is how livable these houses are. And that's the that's interesting really thing. The point Being on the, the Historic District Commission, you have these uh, a set mm -hmm. of rules that are set by the Secretary of the Interior of the United States. Mm -hmm. States that basically sets what you know the basic parameters of what is allowed. Mm -hmm. um, and as the as commissioners, we were always trying to fit that, those rules, with the practical realities of trying to live in a, what's mm -hmm. a livable, functional neighborhood where mm -hmm. people are walking their kids to school and trying to get ready in the morning and all these things. So it, it's always striking a balance between the rules and preserving the historic character mm -hmm. and, on the other hand, making these functional buildings for the, mm -hmm. the 21st century. It's, it's a challenge. But, 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 you, but you do see, and again, this, this is, I think, would be one of the concerns that most people have. You're, I want to put a bathroom on my house, and I don't want to have to ask you. That's what he was saying. And I'm just yeah. saying that this, and that, that is yeah. a, that's a, that's a fair You still question. got to pull a building permit, yeah. and you True. still got to do drawings. But you don't have this additional layer of oversight saying, and again, I'm, I'm not, I'm not yeah. saying this other than I'm going to tell you this is what most people would assume, that, I, you know, whatever's on the outside of my, it has to conform to what you believe is correct. 
there is a reticence. Well, that's the thing, though. Part. isn't I'm what just... we believe is correct. It's a standard that, you know, has applied to this neighborhood since it was made into a district. And, and, and they're national standards. And they're national ours. standards. It's right. not but as long as people standard. know that before they, I mean, I'm just exactly. saying, I, I, I don't think that's fair as an ex post facto case to somebody who has one right. of these properties and says, now, granted, tearing it down is a different story, but if I'm living there and you say, well, you have to, you can't do this because mm -hmm. even though you've lived there, I think if you go in and you know this is exactly because, as I said, I would love to live in a historic district. I can't afford, I mean, you got you guys live in nice places. I live in uh, Georgetown, you know, in a, it's well, not my house no 50 a, year old house. My house is my a thousand square feet. It's okay. <laughs> I, I'm just saying, but I mean, I, I think that the the idea of it's wonderful to hold on to these things. This is a beautiful house when you hear something getting destroyed like that. I mean, that's that, that that's awful. But when I saw when you told me about that, I thought, oh, this well, I haven't seen this. Where is this? Nobody's <laughs> well, going to see that. Yeah. Yeah, except gone. in this picture because the right. university decided to tear it down. It, it certainly was it functional. Like, why couldn't they pick it up and move it somewhere else? Well, uh, what I was going to say, though, they it used just, to. just to kind of, yeah, they it's, used to it's move tough them. to move buildings now. Um, but it's what too, I was many gonna, too many wires. Too many wires. Too many wires, not enough available and, land. And not enough available land. But what I was just going to add was that it's all about the balance. It's about yeah. striking that balance between protecting the character and allowing these buildings to adapt and change for modern use. And that's mm -hmm. always going to be the tension. And I thought, um, I think Ann Arbor does a pretty good job. We've got a really great staff person that really guides people through the process. It's relatively painless from everyone I talk to. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, unless you want to do something that totally violates the rules, which are pretty clear, mm -hmm. and it's a, it's a fairly yeah. straightforward process. And, and it, from what my experience, everyone wants to make these houses livable for people because we want them to survive for another 100, 200 years. And the people who buy these houses know that, well, that's my that, point. that they're going to be subject to this. And generally they, they, they don't and want, they want yeah. it. And Have you ever watched want. some of the zoning board things in uh, some of the nonsense that goes on there in terms of, you, don't, you know, this is one foot, I mean, well, yeah. adding an addition onto your home and it takes a five year study. I mean, well, I'm just, you know, I'm not saying, I'm just saying this is what the average person would think this is some of this stuff is a little out there. And all, but the alternative is, is I mean, we so we all we all drive or walk through the old west side mm -hmm. or these historic districts, and we we admire the buildings, and we admire the character of the street, it's the streetscape as you're walking through that. And it's like, I don't think people realize how that all comes about. It's not it's not natural because mm -hmm. I think it, naturally no, it, it, these it, it would be. It definitely takes a, it's a combination of everyone's efforts. It's just that mm -hmm. I think that from someone's perspective as a private property owner sure. they're not this isn't a public facilities right either. well I sell new houses all the time that have mm -hmm. as many restrictions as the old west side historic district and half the character so you know all these site oh, condo well, neighborhoods mm -hmm. where you can't paint your door bright pink That's you can right. paint your door bright pink in the old west side nobody's mm -hmm. gonna stop you because they don't regulate colors they don't regulate they paint. don't really get colors no so, okay, maybe that's question. Uh, what, what would be the relegation that what would be if what would be something I would do external to my house that you would have you would frown upon from changing the historic. your original door. You change if you had an changes. original door. Okay. If you had original windows, because the wood is fantastic, and if it's repairable. Uh, maybe uh, that. Maybe that. What if it's rotting? If it's well, rotting, different. you're allowed to replace the windows, but they have to maintain the look that the old windows had. Okay. So you're not. Mm -hmm. They don't. They don't like you to put vinyl windows in where there were wood before. So you replace mm -hmm. like with like. Yeah. And if it had six panes of glass, they would like you to have six panes of glass, if possible. Yeah, mm -hmm. just to maintain the original to, look. To, and that, because windows are the, the soul of the house. Right. Somebody okay. said that. Right. Some poet said that. <laughs> but they then end. it isn't that obtrusive. It's not, I mean, it's, it, 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 what, what would be something that you would, I guess maybe that's a better question. What, what would be something that would be out, that would be, you said windows, if a, a cheaper window or something doesn't fit there. What other things would someone necessarily might do that uh, we would have a problem with? Enclose your porch. Yeah, if you had an open porch. Like a screen porch or something? No, well, I'll make a room out of it yeah. and put windows in it. Mm. Uh, all you got to go do is, all you got to do is go to most cities in America and you'll see what everyone's it, well, doing. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> and put an inappropriate dormer like on a third floor that sticks out at a funny angle and is spoils the proportions of the you house. You are taking two windows and turning it into one big vinyl window. That's a really common one. Oh, you know, just okay, things that, yeah. again, these are things that I don't think most contractors or most owners think about, but right. in terms of why these buildings look special or why they have this yeah. certain character, that's what the Secretary of the Interior standards are trying to preserve. What makes the building special? And it's all these little elements playing into the whole. And that's why 
that's why you can have a conversation yeah. about a, a window mutton, you know, for a half hour at the Historic Commission because that's sort of part of the character of the house. But would someone's motivation mainly be economic for the vinyl or just they don't, I mean, that these these third floor, I mean, what, what uh, why, well, where they, why would they want to keep it the same? You're bombarded with ads from wall side windows oh, okay. if you watch TV <laughs> and that makes you want to have them because, everyone, because has them. everyone has them and because they are, do a great job of, of promoting why you would want to replace your windows. Oh, do you have drafty old windows? Well, then put in these new vinyl windows. Well, mm -hmm. the people have, I said once to somebody, why don't we like vinyl windows? He said, because they fall apart. Mm -hmm. In 15 years, they disintegrate and they're no good. Versus uh, my house has its original 1840 windows, so almost 100, and you know, 180 has, years oh, old. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. And my house has, well, my house didn't have its original windows, but the windows mm -hmm. Are from they're 1898. Very <laughs> they're very right. old. So well, we're, we're, I'm going to move us along. I have okay. sure. this, this thankfully isn't an issue because this would be a public building. What is this? Uh, this is Rackham uh, mm -hmm. Graduate. What is the Rackham Graduate Studies okay. Building? Graduate. Is that what you Beautiful, call it? Isn't it? Uh, 1938, mm -hmm. uh, designed by Smith, Hinchman, and Grills. Um, I think they're out of Detroit. Yes. Right. Yes. Okay. They're still in business at the Smith Group. Okay, Smith Group, yeah. Smith Group JJR, I think, mm -hmm. is their official name. So this is a really classic, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it, 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 it holds such an important place on the U of M campus because it's at the other end of the sure, diag, right. you know. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you just this can look straight through from the grad library to mm -hmm. Rackham. And uh, just a really, I, I love it because it's a really uh, interesting mix of art deco and kind of classicism sure. um, mm -hmm. that was popular in the 30s. Mm -hmm. And um, just one of U of M's most beautiful mm -hmm. buildings in my yeah, opinion. Yeah, it's one of my favorite buildings, yeah, it's, and I inside think, and out. And I think that's probably, I mean, we could go on forever. Of course, <laughs> oh, and trust us, we can we go can. on forever. Well, that's why our show does 400 and, and some pages. Here we go. Long. This is it, <laughs> folks. Anyone out there, this is Historic Ann Arbor and Architectural Guide. I'm going to give you the uh, way to contact us on the credits at the end of the show. Also, I would like to give the name of the organizations you were mentioning, the, the Ann Arbor Society. Historical Foundation. And we'll have that as well if you want to go on the website and contact. I want to thank you both, and Patrick and Washington Susan. And Washington County Historical Society. And I'll get that out there as well. Okay. I want to thank you both for being on A21 okay. Site. This has been a nice very informative, thank you for very interesting us. event. And uh, for A21 Site, until next time, I'm James Trost.